The only thing that we're interested in is putting money in your wallet. If you want to bet the fights, if you want to have a little bit of action, you are in the right place with my partner, Ian Parker. I am Beretto Komodo. We're ready to rock between our parlays, our props, our straight picks. It's time to make money. Let's go. The UFC is in its hometown of Las Vegas this weekend, but that is not the apex that you were looking at. It is at big T-Mobile Arena on the Las Vegas Strip, and it is Noche UFC, Mexico against the world on this main card on Saturday, headlined by Alexa Grasso taking on Valentina Shevchenko in a rematch for the Flyweight Championship, and we are here to discuss it from a gambling perspective as always. Hello, everybody. I am Brett Okamoto alongside Ian Parker. Very cool idea for this uh, for this uh, UFC fight night. It is Mexico against the world, except for Kevin Holland and Jack Della Maddalena, but we will allow that to go on, um, even though because it is such a great fight. But before we get to all that, let's talk about last week, UFC 293. How did we do on our best bets, Mr. Parker? You know what? Last week could have been a really, really good one instead, and not so great win three and three. Adesanya Strickland under four and a half rounds. I don't think anyone would have thought the fight went the way it did. And you know what? Strickland was almost the one that had to go under four and a half that first round drop. We hit Tuivasa Volkov with that Ezekiel choke in round two. Manel Cap, I am shocked he couldn't get it done. Dropped those Santos in round one. That kid is tough. Pedro, we mentioned this. If he gets out of the first round, we were good. In the meantime, he was the one that landed the knockout. And then Olberg and Jusette, we both won. So went three and three. Missed out on the parlay. It started off with a dislocated elbow of Jack Jenkins. Then Izzy dropped. And we lost the prop of the night with Izzy by TK Rokeo as he lost to the new middleweight champ, Sean Strickland. Well, we were flying high there for a while, so a cool down was, uh, it was going to come at some point, so it happened at UFC 293, but it wasn't all bad. We got uh, some of our best bets in, and now we just start another hot streak right now at UFC Noche, and that is going to look like a main card, and it's going to be just like a pay-per-view schedule. It's 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. You can find it on ESPN+. Plus. Again, Alexa Grasso taking on Valentina Shevchenko. Very, very curious to get your thoughts on that. Such a big line movement after what happened in the first one. Kevin Holland and Jack Della Maddalena, the only fight that isn't Mexico against the world, but that is okay because I still very much want to see this fight. Very excited to talk to you about that one as well. And then the rest of them, all the Mexicans taking on uh, a variety of opponents there on your main card. Again, at 10 Eastern on ESPN+. And let's go straight to the main event, as we always do. Alexa Grasso is your champion, and there has been a big-time switch in the line. The first time that they fought... Valentina Shevchenko, it was a Valentina Chino, it was a Valentina Shevchenko type line. She was about a nine to one favorite, Ian, and now she is only a minus 175. That is a massive correction. And you can see here, that even wasn't where they started. They started a little bit higher, it was minus 230, but you've had some bets come in and to take it down to minus 175. So not only has there been a big, big correction, the money is actually coming in on the underdog champion. Cannot wait for your thoughts on this. Take it any direction you want to go, take it away. Well, to start off, I, I can understand why the Grasso number, where money's been coming in on the new champ. For starters, Valentina, her fight against Talia Santos, a lot of people thought she lost. And then in this fight, you know, round one went to Grasso, Valentina took round two and three, and then she made a mistake with that spin back kick. So maybe people believe that at Valentina's age, that the two fights, she didn't look her same dominant way, then maybe it's the changing of the guard here. Okay, now normally I would say, hey, you know what, that's a pretty good trend, that makes a lot of sense, except... Valentina, you just said it yourself. We have not seen a line other than against Amanda Nunez, which is the only other person she's lost to in God knows how long, where the number hasn't been astronomical. So the fact that it's minus 175 here, I like that for Valentina. You know, round one, I think that was her kind of getting the cobwebs out of the way, wiping away the Talia Santos fight, because round two and round three, Shevchenko started to take over, and even around four, she was winning until she threw that spinning back kick, which she missed. Grasso timed it, taking the back perfectly and got the choke. But nothing about that fight showed me that Valentina, you know, she is, is really on the downhill at all. And that's not taking anything away from Alexa Grasso. We talked about this in the last show, and I'll mention it again. She's got fantastic striking. She's got underrated jujitsu. Over her time in the UFC, she has improved off her back, her takedown defense in general. However, at this line, a lot of people may jump on Grasso and say, hey, plus money. I don't even mind people taking the plus five and a half. That means that Grasso just has to win one round on the scorecard and Valentina doesn't win inside the distance to get a clean sweep. I still like the bullet here. I love what she said in the interviews. I am more hungry now. I still have time. She's not done. 
I'm going Valentina Shevchenko to get the belt back at minus 175. I still think she's better everywhere. Just don't throw that spinning back kick in the later rounds, and I think she'll be just fine. Yeah, man, I want to give my thoughts on this quickly because I, this one I do have sort of a, an opinion on from a gambling perspective. Because for me, if I was going to be betting this main event, it would come down to two schools of thought. And that is, one, that Valentina is getting figured out, right? Because the Talia Santos fight was close, closer than expected, and then she goes on and loses to Alexa Grasso. So are you thinking to yourself, hey, have people figured her out a little bit? Or the second school of thought is that, man, when you are at the top for so long, it is just difficult. It's difficult mentally. It's difficult with all the responsibilities that you have. It's difficult to get up for every single fight. We've seen it time and time again. We saw it with Anderson Silva and his weird performance against Chris Weidman. We just saw it. I think, you know, not to take anything away from Sean Strickland, but a little bit of a flat performance by Israel Adesanya. So you're in one of those two schools of thought. Is Valentina Shevchenko getting figured out or was she just feeling the fatigue of a champion, and if she is over that fatigue and you like her mentality, then you love this line. You love this line because you're getting a great value. So to me, that would be the question I would be asking, and you just saw the methods of victory there. I understand that you have the prop of the night right off the bat. It's in the main event. Go ahead and give it to us. Yeah, I'm going to double down on Valentina here and say she gets it done by decision. You know, Brett, you made a really good point that sometimes when you have that much success for a long time, especially the dominance, there's a comfort level. I don't think Talia Santos necessarily figured out Valentina to answer your question, if that was a question. You know, I think it was more about, hey, maybe Valentina, again, was back to that comfort level. Hasn't fought someone as physically strong as someone in Talia Santos. We just saw Talia fend off three rounds of takedowns to Aaron Blanchfield, right? And no one else has been able to do that per se. And then with Alexa Grasso, she was winning rounds two and three. Valentina was really, the momentum was shifting in her favor tremendously until that missed kick. So I think she gets this done by decision. I think she's going to be very cautious in some of the tricky spinning stuff that she throws. Even if she's up three, nothing in these rounds, she's going to stick to what she's good at. I think she's also going to utilize that ground game more. She had a lot of success in that fight when she took Grasso to the ground. So let's go Valentina by decision at plus 160. Yeah, yeah, man. And we're going to get to this co-main event because it's a fun one. But Amanda Nunes, you know, a, a very, very weird fight against Juliana Pena. I mean, we saw it in, in that circumstance as well. I just, I, I think that this line, if you do think that it was just sort of a mental hiccup for Valentina, then again, you just freaking love this line because you're going from minus 900 to minus 175. And as you mentioned earlier in your analysis, Ian, she was ahead on the scorecards. She was ahead. She was probably close to going yep. up three to one in that fight. And yet you have this huge, huge, huge correction. So it's just kind of depending on what you think is going on with Valentina Shevchenko. Let's Let's go to the 170 pound division. It's Kevin Holland taking on Jack De La Maddalena. An interesting note for me here is it's the third fight for Kevin Holland this year, but I think a more um, important number is that his, his fourth fight in 10 months at the welterweight limit, he doesn't seem to be having a, huge, a very, very hard time getting there, but that is extremely active even by his standards. And then you got Jack De La Maddalena who's supposed to fight Sean Brady in July. That fight didn't happen, so we still have got to see this guy against the test. I would say this is it. What do you think about this line at Jack De La Maddalena, minus 155? I think the line should be flipped. I think the wrong person is the underdog here, and the wrong person is the favorite. And I'm going based on, look, level of competition, the resume in itself. Kevin Holland has beaten fighters that are better than Jack Del Maddalena based on where Jack is at currently in his career. Now, we know Jack has won all of his fights minus the last one, round one, TK or sub, okay? Randy Brown, I thought that fight was going to go a little deeper. He caught him. But Kevin Holland is very durable, okay? He knows how to get himself out of bad situations, and he's a little underrated when it comes to his submission game, as we saw between Darshunk's guillotines in the past. JDM... I thought was a little too exposed in that last fight against his opponent who he took on short notice. He got out-wrestled. He made some really poor decisions. He kept jumping the guillotine against Basil. And for me, and he took a lot of shots, okay? I mean, he gave a lot. He took a lot. And a, a lot of people thought he got away with one there on the split decision. Nothing what I have seen shows that he's going to go against someone. Holland is not someone, even though he talks a lot, who really, he doesn't fight stupid. Minus the Wonder Boy fight where he should have obviously taken Stephen Wonder Boy Thompson to the ground when he dropped and said, let him get up. Here, I'm going with Kevin Holland as the underdog here. The value is way too solid here. Jack in that last fight, I think Kevin could wrestle. I know we're all laughing when I say that probably because Kevin gets taken down, but I could see him rocking Jack, Jack out Medellin in the second round and latching onto a sub. You know, I just think that Holland is being over, or un, well, underlooked here, overlooked here, whatever the term is. Jack Dell is not for anyone like him. I think Holland gets it done here. 
Worth noting that uh, Kevin's uh, wrestling problems have happened more at 185 than 170. It doesn't mean that it can't happen, and he'll, we'll see when he goes, starts going up against some of those top-notch wrestlers, but his problems at, in wrestling have happened more at that bigger, that higher weight class. And we, can bear, we can't even get through the main card because uh, Ian keeps throwing props at us. You have a long shot parlay on the co-main event. What do we got on the, uh, the co-main event long shot parlay? Or prop, excuse me. Ian, you know, oh, you're good. You know what? He, he's going to be part of the long shot parlay, too. So we'll just throw that in there. You know what? Kevin Holland, I like him by round two. <laughs> round two submission. I'm feeling froggy in this one, Brett. Let, you know, it, for me, I think that Holland's going to stand on the feet. He's going to have a nice way to strike from a distance. And I don't think he's too worried about Jack taking him down to the ground. And if I think if he rocks him in round two, look, Jack slowed down in his last fight. First fight, we saw him go into rounds two and three and really slow down, was taking a lot of shots. I don't think he could take a crisp, clean Kevin Holland right cross the way he took it on his last opponent. And what happens when guys get rocked? They shoot in for lazy singles. That Darsh choke or guillotine will be right there. Kevin Holland round two sub at plus 1,800. Let's go. All right, so those images of De La Maddalena putting himself in those guillotines, sticking with Ian Parker for this matchup against Kevin Holland. Let's run through the rest of this main card. It starts with Raul Rosas Jr. taking on Terrence Mitchell. The zero in the loss column is gone from Rosa Jr.'s record, but he is still a massive favorite, the biggest favorite on the card, minus 800. What do you think? Uh, you know what? I don't like this number, and I, I actually I really hate this number for him. Uh, his last fight, look, we know what he's about. He's going to try and take this fight to the floor. He's good at subs. The kid is so young, and this fight maybe makes sense because Mitchell lost his last fight by sub to Karen, Cameron Simon. But when you know that the person has no striking to the point where it's not a threat, you can defend the takedowns. You know what? I, I would sprinkle something on Mitchell here maybe, but for me, I'm taking a different shot. How about the fight to start round two at plus 165? Mitchell defends, maybe loses in round two. Okay, good analysis there. Let's go to the lightweight division as Daniel Zuhalber taking on Christos Yagos. What do you got for this one? So for Zell Huber, that nine is a little high for me coming off his last win. And Yagos is someone who has fought plenty. He's a seasoned vet, very aggressive. But Zell Huber is a sniper. And when he can get off and not let his opponent get inside, that's where he does his best. I like Zell Huber here. I would throw him in a parlay. Or if that number comes down a little bit lower, then don't mind taking him on the money line. All right, and rounding out the main card is Fernando Padilla taking on Kyle Nelson, another pretty significant favorite, minus 250. What do you think? This one's another weird line for me. Kyle Nelson coming off a win against Blake Builder, and I'm not saying that Builder's a world beater here, but, but Kyle Nelson's fought some decent competition. Very tough. When he loses, it's by decision. When he's won, other than the Builder fight, he's won by knockout. Padilla looked fantastic against Julian, Julian Rosa. I like this fight to go over one and a half rounds. I think Padilla is getting a little bit of a more durable opponent in Nelson, and I think that's where we're going to see this fight go into deep round two, possibly round three. All right, so a lot of information there on your main card, but we got a preliminary, preliminary card to go through, as always. So take us through your prelim picks for this Noche UFC on Saturday. Well, Brett, as of right now with DraftKings, some of these lines I'm going to talk about, I'm going to need them to look for because they're not up yet. Like, Loopy Gordon is against Elise Reed, minus 440. Really high number there. The wrestling, the striking, she's better everywhere. I think she gets it done. Look for that prop by decision. Roman Kopilov, minus 330. Right now, there's an over-under of two and a half. If you could find an alternative line when the lines come out over one and a half, I like it there. Or a late round TKO by Roman. Daniel Lacerda, look, this is one of the most fun fighters to watch in round one. If he doesn't get it done, he loses in round two. So I don't mind taking a shot here to get it done in round one. But if he doesn't get it done, he slows down. Throw a live bet on Edgar Charas, who we saw fight Tetsero Tyra recently. Tracy Cortez coming off a year layoff. A lot of stuff on her plate outside the UFC. Coming against Jasmine, Jazz Davisius. And Jasmine just beat Miranda Maverick by decision. She's the underdog here. Give me Jasmine. I don't care if it's UFC Noche. I'm taking the Canadian. Charlie Campbell making his UFC debut against Alex Rance, who hasn't fought in four years. Campbell, we saw in the Contender Series, was winning, and then he got knocked out by Charlie. Uh, by uh, sorry, by Chris Duncan. Give me Charlie Campbell. Flying very high. Look for the TKO prop when it comes out. Last but not least, Josephine Knudsen against Marnik Mann. Mann taking this fight on short notice. Knudsen we just saw on the contender series. She looked great. Minus 700 is out of control. Look for her inside the distance when that prop becomes available as well. All right, let's just keep these picks coming. Let's move on to Parker's parlay for Saturday. What do we got on the parlay this weekend? 
All right, we're going to keep it short and sweet. I'm going Zell Huber here. I think the momentum off his last fight and the way Giago is sometimes a little over-aggressive, I think he gets sniped. We're going to go Zell, Huber. Zell Huber. Love what Roman Kopilov has done in his last three fights. Now, friend is tough, but Kopilov, the biggest difference here, Brett, he has been training with a lot of the Dagestani fighters, so you see that takedown defense is so good. If you stand up with him, you're in trouble. And last but not least, Charlie Campbell. So the three-leg parlay, plus 120. Let's go. Short and sweet, get that easy payout and get out of there. I like it. How about the best bets for this weekend? Now, Brett, normally, I think for the trend for a while, has been given out six. The lines just weren't there, and I'm not in the business to force plays. We're here to win plays. So let's start off. I'm going to go with the former champ and possibly add new and Valentina Shevchenko. The line, we haven't seen a line like this in her in forever, and because of a spinning back kick, that was the only difference. She was up two to run and possibly going to three to one, like you said. Valentina. Kevin Holland, a plus 130. I don't think he should be the underdog here based on who he's fought, how he's won those fights. And based off of Jack Delamadolita's last you know, performance, he finally got pressured. He couldn't get the fight done in round one. He looked a little panicky, made some poor decisions. I think Holland capitalizes. Padilla Nelson. Padilla is a knockout artist. Got it against Arosa round one, but he's fighting someone in Nelson who is extremely, extremely durable. When he's been finished, it's been in the later rounds. Nelson also, I think, is flying under the radar here. Might be a live dog. Let's go over one and a half rounds. So, Brett, after the Padilla Nelson over one and a half, we're going to go on to Lupe Goynez and Elise Reed. I think Lupe wins this fight, but out of all of her fights, she's only finished one most by decision. So, let's go Goynez by decision. That probably up later today on the DraftKings Sportsbook. And last but not least, I'm going to go with Jasmine here. Look, I think Tracy Cortez is a very solid prospect, strong wrestler. But we saw in her last fight, she was taken down by Melissa Gatto. She had to come back and win in round three and really grind it out. And Jasmine just won a dominant decision, who I think against a better fighter in Miranda Maverick. She should not be the underdog here. We got two dogs on this card. We're going to go with Jasmine. Moneyline is the final best bet. All right. Five best bets and a couple of them underdogs. Love that. How about for our long shot parlay? What do we got? You know what? I, I, I'm not. I, I've told people, and I'm stuttering on my own words here. If the dogs are there, and I think the value's there, I'm going to let them bark. We're going to go Kevin Holland, Kyle Nelson, Dan Lacerda, and Jasmine Jasdavisius. At that number is insane. All underdogs. I think every one of these plays are live. If Nelson could get into the round two and three, I think his cardio and durability can get him there against someone who's only making their second fight in the UFC. And Lacerda, his last two fights, we've seen him up in round one, dropping his opponents. And then he fades in round two. Maybe this is the time he gets it done in round one. Four dogs, that's a crazy line right there. Let's go. All right, it is a pay-per-view-esque UFC fight night. It's taking place at T-Mobile. It's on your normal pay-per-view schedule, 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific, ESPN+. Plus. And yeah, I gotta say, as a, from a gambling perspective, for me personally, I would be taking either Valentina or nothing just because I feel like the line has moved so much. But if Alexa Grasso pulls this off, wow, we are gonna have a lot to talk about because Grasso will have really solidified herself as one of the top fighters in the game, taking out Valentina twice. That'll be something to talk about. We will look back on it next week. And then of course, we will be talking about all of the rest of the action coming up in 2023. Appreciate the watch. Hopefully you got some good information and come back and see us next time. Enjoy the fights. Goodbye.